Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, so we had a lot of great um, speakers up here, and they all seem to agree that democracy is great. Civil society is great. Human development is great. But this is the NORAD conference, and ultimately, NORAD is tasked to invest in these things. Right? And that's what we're going to discuss now. How do we support democracy? How can we invest in these uh, good attributes that we've been talking about? And that's a very different ballgame. But to help me talk about this subject and discuss this subject, we have four excellent panelists that you've already seen and have already seen introduced up here. That's Ramon Johansson from uh, Norwegian People's Aid. It's Lisa John, the Secretary General of Civicus. It's Marianne Dahl from uh, the Peace Research, Institution, Peace Research Institute of Oslo. That's where I work, but I still can't pronounce it properly. <laughs> and Bård Vegard from, uh, from NORAD. Give them all an uh, applause. <clears throat> all right, welcome to stage. Um, so I wanted to start off the conversation by uh, addressing you, uh, Raymond Johansson. Working with the Norwegian People's Aid, you are the, 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 the organization on stage right now that actually works with actual projects to support democracy worldwide. Could you give us an example, just to give us an image, how does a project like that look like? What's an example of that? Well, first of all, democratic is one of the most used and misused words. I think the North Korea call themselves democratic. And if automatically it means that if you pretend to be democratic, then you immediately receive a lot of money. Therefore, it's about finding civil organizations that actually have trust and confidence in a knowledge in the local community. Therefore, you need to have a power and actor analysis, and you need to find the right actors closest to the people. And uh, that's also the case in Norway. We can see, for example, after flooding, after national crisis, then the quickest one to respond is those who have knowledge about the loca uh, local community, which also have trust in the local community. During my intervention, I mentioned examples from uh, Guatemala. I can also mention examples from Honduras. And I mentioned from, from Sudan that the civil actors themselves, with the sufficient confident, can play a role and be a ground for that. And uh, I didn't have time to mention our support in Ukraine for Ukrainian women that we started to support before the war. And then they have confidence, and then when the war occur, then they played an instrumental role. And I was warning, and I think it's the right place to address this. It's very important that this is not donor-driven. And it's not just respond on the donor's requirement, because we have a detailed uh, requirements for what we want from the civil actors, then it's easy to create also artificial NGOs that actually not have the sufficient confidence and trust among the local people. So then to have this uh, power analysis in advance to find the partners and work with them for a long time, I think uh, that's a prerequisite for success. <clears throat> Requirements that we want uh, from the people we fund, that sounded like an elbow to you, uh, Bord yeah. um, uh, The unbeatable combination of democracy, liberty and, uh, and economic growth, I think that was the quote mm -hmm. that you said, close enough. But what does NORAD know about what works? What, what do you know about how we can actually put our money to promote uh, civil society actors, promote human rights, promote democracy? Hmm. So, 
So yeah, uh, let me at least say four points uh, um, uh, about that, or four things I think we kind of know at least. <laughs> And the first is uh, what uh, Raimon just mentioned. So it's easy for me to see it here, of course, say, no, no, we not, should not be donor-driven. But, but it's true. We, we know that if it's demand-driven, to use that word, I mean, needs-driven, it works better. Yes. Uh, because, you know, he, you know, Nurad, you have fantastic employees, but they know letter, l less about the situation on the ground around the world than people who actually are there. And, no, in the need. So that's what we're trying to apply, and, and increasingly so. We're working a lot with it. Second, I mean, we do know that you know, uh, development assistance to de democracy and human rights. Of course, you know, good example, bad example. On average, it has had a positive effects in the modern world. You know, it, you know and I'm meaning after the the, uh, the, the Cold War. So uh, that's an average, of course, in the, those are ex there are examples that are fantastic. There are examples that it didn't work, but it was right, the right thing to do anyway, maybe. But it does have an effect. The third thing I think we, we know a little bit from the research, and Marianne also touched on this, that some of the best effects or, and the most important impacts come when we support those who keep, uh, hold governments accountable, and they're a bit on the side of the government. Civil society is, of course, the biggest part of it, but also journalism, the free press. And luckily, almost a quarter of everything Norad spent on behalf of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs goes through civil society in, in some form. So for Norway, civil society is a huge and an important partner. The fourth thing, thing I think we know also, unfortunately, is that, well, you know, development assistance can be really important, but it works better as part of a democratization effort. You know, when there's a movement in the right direction, it can't stop the backsliding of a country. So, you know, it, do, it can't stop a, an authoritarian government from changing a country in the wrong direction. But it can sometimes be right to do it, you know, to support activists, uh, journalists and others anyway. But, you know, it doesn't have that kind of power. Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, pivot to to one of the difficulties that that we uh, Marianne has highlighted in in her report also, and uh, I I wanted to ask you, Lisa, you you write in your report as part of the recommendations that that um, you should you should uh, provide core support to these civil society organizations. That that seems to be a, a obvious way uh, course of action here. But we also know that a lot of these authoritarian governments, they, they can install these legislations uh, where civil society organizations are labeled the foreign agents or somehow enemies of the state. And being associated with Western donors could certainly emphasize uh, that aspect of, of those civil society organizations. Are there ways we can support these groups without uh, simultaneously uh, ruin their reputation domestically? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think there are a lot of labels uh, attached to work that's done to reinforce democracy and civic space, but the most mind-boggling of them is the idea that democracy is somehow a Western concept. So essentially, we're being told that the great nations that colonized the rest of the world came into our countries, overtook our political and economic institution, pillaged our natural resources, uh, pretty much you know, uh, you know, uh, attacked significant aspects of our culture, then left after giving us the idea of democracy uh, and rights. So <laughs> it, it's so preposterous, and I think the only example you need to counter that uh, uh, is, is really the fact that, you know, it, it is 30 years this year for, uh, that South Africa is uh, celebrating democracy. It's 30 years since the first election. The first country to impose sanctions against the apartheid regime was not a Western country, it was India. Uh, so I think we should really push back on the notion that the idea of justice well, as an Indian, I can say we are in a very worried situation now, so we, we need to reclaim that uh, glory. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but really, the idea of justice and, and what is right doesn't belong to a nation state. The idea of nation states itself is less than 150 years old. It, it really, we are human and we are hardwired to think about 
justice, democracy, and, and what, you know, we need to live in dignity, and that's, I think, a universal concept. So we, we really must fight the notion that any one country or any one continent or any one part of the world owns the universal, you know, uh, idea of human rights that belongs to all of us, no matter where we come from. Yes. That's good. <laughs> um, uh, is this something, is this an issue that you face in the Norwegian People's Aid? Uh, dealing with uh, like how being associated with you could put people in harm's way? Uh, I don't have detailed. I've been there six or general for one month, so <laughs> excuse me for not knowing uh, all this. But generally speaking, of course, then it's uh, easy to claim uh, also local organizations that actually receive money from Western donors uh, that uh, they are not independent and that are driven from, from the West. So therefore, it's so important to actually find partners which has confidence and trust on the ground from their own population. Mm. That's, that, uh, that I think it's, it's a key and uh, uh, also what Lisa said here, it's uh, really of most importance that this is not an Western ideas and uh, Listen these days that 14 countries have said that they want to freeze the assistance to UNRWA mm. after the ICG rulings. What do I think that will have a great impact also for, uh, for Western donors and countries these days about the legitimacy for uh, democracy to promote human rights and what we are standing for. So uh, it's an extremely important job that the Norwegian government is doing to promote the continuous support to UNRWA. This is going to be very relevant for the months to come. So let's pick up on, Bård Vegar uh, said that uh, so it's difficult to, to stop an uh, autocratization process once the ball is rolling. Uh, but uh, Lisa John, in your report you also write that the that uh, the international actors, democracy promoters, they should um, put pressure on, on governments to, to have them repeal uh, non-democratic legislation. Um, but so that one can imagine that that's a different course of action. Instead of investing in the civil society, we could go into more classical bilateral uh, diplomacy and we could have a stick in a carrot approach. Right? We could uh, stop financial uh, aid flows, we could um, promise uh, great uh, investments should they uh, promote certain laws that we like and uh, the opposite if they don't. How far do you think we should go in this pressure by international act actors? So I think it, it's, it's been really clear in the last few years and especially, I mean, of course, before that as well, that this kind of piecemeal approach to responding to crisis, violation and emergencies is really not working. So every year, you have a crisis, whether it was Afghanistan or Myanmar, uh, you know, then we had Russia attacking Ukraine, now you have Israel and, and, and Palestine. And every year then we try to use sanctions as, uh, or, or the aid cuts rather, not political sanctions, economic sanctions, as a way to make a point about our values. It, it's simply not working. Uh, and I, I think we've seen, especially in countries where LGBT plus movements are, uh, you know, at risk, that when you, uh, affect when the aid flows, especially to civil society, are affected, you're actually doing more harm to the very groups that you're trying yes. to protect. And a, a lot of groups have spoken up quite strongly because uh, many, uh, you know, kind of uh, European countries uh, started, uh, you know, linking especially the Israel-Palestine conflict to their own aid. They started cutting off aid to, uh, you know, Palestinian uh, rights organizations. That simply isn't a viable strategy. If anything, it's, it's actually hurting uh, the cause more and we should be doing even more than we are now to support groups who are on the ground, who are living on a day-to-day -day basis, the very difficult reality that we're only seeing from afar. And there are very many means to do that. So we've, we've done studies about, you know, how you resource activism and movements in closed contexts. There are groups that work on, on, on ways in which you can do that. And it's not impossible. All it takes is the political will and the policy, uh, really, uh, decision to say that aid doesn't belong to a particular country. It's, again, this whole, you know, kind of colonization mindset to say that the money that I am giving you is money that belongs to me and I'm kind of doing you a favor by putting it forward for development. That money was taken from a lot of other countries, you know, in, in the past generations. It belongs... 
it belongs to all of us, and I'm really happy that there's a vibrant debate on the idea of global public investment. There are some colleagues here uh, representing that work as well, because the idea of global public investment is that the, the money that we put into aid and development belongs to the world. It doesn't belong to nation states. It doesn't, certainly doesn't belong to governments. It belongs to citizens of the world and communities of the world, and we should have a say in how that, that is uh, you know, allocated. Um, do we have any research on this, uh, Mariana, on this interplay between protest movements and uh, sanctions, international uh, action? So, uh, of course, uh, when it comes to sanctions, it's uh, complicated. Uh, and uh, we do know that sanctions tend to work better on democracies. Just uh, look to Norway when China sanctioned us. It worked pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> and it does <laughs> on autocracies. But when you have a movement in a country, it turns out that having economic sanctions that a lot of countries join in on actually helps the movement. Increase, it increases the likelihood of success, and it does so by increasing the number of people who participate and the likelihood that you see these lo large loyalty shifts amongst the security forces. And one case to, to mention is South Africa. Like it could be that South Africa would have been a success at, uh, also without the international pressure through economic sanctions. But it also seems that this played a key role in making it so hard for the economic elite that they again went to the clerk to pressure him mm. to negotiate with Mandela. Mm. All right. Is this something Nordad uh, considers, Bordevega, to stop aid flows? So now I'm not going to pull up a phrase that I find useful from, from time to time. That's a political question. <laughs> <laughs> Always comes out a bit weirdly, though, when I say it. But, uh, <laughs> but, but well, I would say, firstly, I mean, humanitarian aid is not political. Should always be there. It's mm. about human dignity. So that's one. Two, uh, like Lisa uh, says, I mean, we should be extremely reluctant. That's my you know, technical advice uh, because uh, because it's rights-based, like the minister just said, but also because we sh you should think about the consequences. Is it for the better to stop development assistance? But of course then, there are situations where you cannot really do any good or work well through development assistance. So we have had situations where we did stop the Norwegian development assistance to Myanmar, uh, except humanitarian, because we, we found that, we, or the politicians found that it couldn't work there. So there are situations but, but we have to be reluctant with, uh, with that tool. Uh, uh, I think that's important. Mm. I think it's also about the phrases that we are using. We're using aid. It's uh, often more about redistribution. Mm. A country like Norway, we have been tremendous rich over the last year because of the ongoing war in Russia. Uh, the oil prices have increased. The gas prices has increased. And that's not uh, because of what's itself. So uh, that we also, because we are so tremendous rich in an open global economy, uh, we need also to redistribute. And of course it's aid, but it's also to ourselves. I think that's uh, what we are lacking in the national debate. Mm. Uh, we have to do utmost to stop the climate change. Of course, then we need trem tremendous investment in rainforests in Brazil, New Papua New Guinea, Indonesia. But of course, if you're talking about just uh, 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 the climate change and to stop the CO2 pollution, then you not can give assistance to the poorer con poorest country because they are not polluted that much. So therefore, we need also for the interest of ourselves to do investment in our own future also, to see that people coming elsewhere, they can have a prosperous future and a future at itself. So that's one thing I want to do as a new Secretary General of, the, of MPA, is also to have the, this debout, debate about the phrasing, because we feel so generous, so good, but it's about redistribution, and it's also about helping our own generation in the future 
by supporting and cooperating with other countries. So uh, therefore, we need help to do that. Um, yes, I want I want to ask. So, so, um, uh, Madame, in the uh, academic debate, we sometimes we sometimes talk about like these two paths to to democracy, and one of them is. Uh, is the more the people's kind of almost revolutionary path. Uh, some of the images we see from the Arab Spring or Port Portugal, uh, this brings to mind like the, the people uh, toppling the government and installing installing democracy. But we also have this this other uh, other path to democracy, where a country is autocratic, but it has these sham elections, autocratic elections, but. Over the course of time, they just kind of slip into democracy peacefully and, and stably. Taiwan is a, is a typical example of, of, of this path. So let's say Bordeaux got here, he invites you to his office, he wants some expert opinion, he wants to invest in democracy. Would you invest in the revolutions or would you invest in the, <laughs> the sham elections? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a very good question. <laughs> it's a nice phrasing, this. They slip into democracy. <laughs> if that's an opportunity that Russia can just slip into democracy through its elections in March, let's just go for that. But when it comes to these pacted um, democracy processes, these uh, elite splits, that leads to democracy from the top, it often originates at the bottom. Like these splits, these inspirations to democratize, they come from somewhere, and often that somewhere is mass mobilization. Okay, so that being said, I, I really don't think Nordad should invest in Putin's elections or other elections. It seems weird. We're not weird. planning to. No, good. <laughs> Just imagine the headlines. Mm. <coughs> uh, I also don't think you should start a revolution. It has to be, like, this echoes what you have said earlier, it has to be through these bottom-up processes. But investing in civil society long term so that when the opportun opportunity arises that mass these mass movements have the origin, uh, organizational structure to work from, if that's possible, that's a great idea. And I think also I've talked about how autocrats have adapted and learned. And if we can help movements make use or the same learning processes in the best ways possible to facilitate or to strengthen these networks that already exist, that combines these uh, civil society movements together, that would be a good way to go about it. And with that, I think we've uh, had a lot of uh, food for thoughts that we can bring to the actual uh, food uh, during lunch. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your participation, and uh, I s think we're now moving to lunch. <laughs> Maybe someone else will tell. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.